Brian Lenskis from the Low Carb MD Podcast, and I'm joined by Ramon Issa. He is going to be a big star, and I'm just so stoked to be able to interview him for the first time and break him out and let people know his story because it's amazing. So why don't you tell people your story and how you started and, you know? Sure. Well, um, I'm a family medicine trained uh, physician. I worked at Loma Linda University as well as the medical director at the East Campus Urgent Care. Um, my, the reason why I'm here is because I myself, I became, uh, I was born healthy and I was active. I was pretty much an athlete, but I got overweight and I gradually just put on weight throughout residency and then after residency with a uh, stressful life and a schedule and I ballooned all the way up to 308 pounds, morbidly obese. I was popping out of my suits and one of the first things that happened was I was looking in my closet trying to put on a suit to go to work for a meeting and I told my wife, I'm like, hey, we need to get some bigger suits and she's like, or you can do something else. I was like, no, it's like people wear suits that fit. Yeah, that happened to me, the same thing. All my clothes shrunk at the same time. It was really weird. I didn't even take them to the laundry or anything, yeah. That's actually what I thought happened. I thought <laughs> my suits were shrinking. That was one thing. And then I went to the urgent care because I, I was uh, caroling, Christmas caroling with the kids, and I thought I broke my, my, my foot. So I went to my urgent care where I work, and I wanted to just get an x-ray. And the nurse said, no, you gotta get triage. And so when they triage, they did my blood pressure and I'd, ne I'd always had normal blood pressure. My blood pressure was like 175 over 100 and she just, her jaw dropped. And she's like, Dr. Issa. And I said, yeah, it's cause I broke, broke my foot. But inside I was freaking out. Yeah, so then what happened? How did you get on this road to say I got to change something? So I was, I'd always try to lose weight. I'd struggle with weight for many, many years and I could never eat less. I could never exercise enough. Like you mentioned in your talk, when, you're tr when your body is morbidly obese and you're hurting, it's a terrible time to be jumping around on a treadmill or you know, do all these exercises. I would hurt afterwards or I'd be hungry and then I'd screw up my eating less. It just didn't work. My, unfortunately, it took something tragic as my dad passing away uh, in April of 2017. And I took care of him at home and he died from all the things that I was having the beginnings of metabolic syndrome. He had diabetes, obesity, fatty liver. He was on insulin. He had strokes and heart attacks. And I watched it with my very eyes, the end of the road that I felt like, if I don't do something, I'm gonna end up like that. But I was only 40, you know, in my early 40s. Yeah, that's a scary thing. People don't realize that doctors are dying 10 years before their patients in general, you know? And I think when you start understanding that, you think, wow, our lifestyle, we're under constant stress, we're stress eating, you know, we're eating all throughout the day. And you as an ER doc, you're seeing the, the ravages of this disease process. So maybe tell people some of the things that you're seeing that are overwhelming our system. Right, so the things that I'm seeing, and I see it every day, and then I started to see it, and my dad personally hit me close to home, is just the disability and the pain and the suffering. But more than that, more than the sickness, and you also, Brian, you hit it uh, in your talk today. Um, you know, in the beginning of It's a Wonderful Life, in that movie, they're ta God's talking with the angel, and he's talking about um, you know, um, uh, Jimmy Stewart. I forgot his character's name. But anyway, the angel says, I is he sick? What's going on? What's wrong with this guy? Why do I have to go down to earth and help this guy? Is he sick? Is he dying? And God's like, no, he's discouraged. He has no hope. So yeah. I see patients, the biggest thing is they have no hope, yeah. they're discouraged. Yeah, and they've been told over and over, this is the way it is. You watch your dad go through that and you think, okay, I'm destined to the same thing. And that's why us docs who are on the front lines get so passionate about it because the worst thing for us is to be overwhelmed with sick people. You know, even with this COVID that's going around right now, it's a, uh, it's the, the sickest people there, the diabetics and the people with lung disease, you know, and, and both those are associated with, you know, with the nicotine, the high insulin, the high sugars, all those things put us at risk of all these other disease processes. So when we see people getting better doing what we're doing, uh, we realize the long-term implication is not just about losing a few pounds, it's about being metabolically healthy. Mm -hmm. So when we start understanding that, we really have to scrap what we've been taught. Yep, and that's exactly what I did when I got better. So I was suffering all these problems. I had, gir I had heartburn, I, I was snoring, I had sleep apnea, I was tired all the time, I was fatigued, uh, I was, yeah, uh, my joints hurt, I couldn't get up in the morning, it took me hours to wake up, I gotta see patients and you gotta be critically awake and alert. Things were getting worse and worse and my wife kept telling me, go see your doctor, you're sick, something's going on, your blood pressure, this and that, my triglycerides were up and I said no because I'm, I used to be that person in the office and I know what I would tell myself if I came in in this situation and I would just say, eat less, move more, and take these pills. And I said, honey, that's never worked. None of my patients ever got better. And when I used to do clinic practice, I said, if I'm gonna get better, it's gonna be something that I've been telling my patients all these years. So what got you started? What was it, was it someone said, like, as far as 
Like she said, look, you got to do something about this stuff. But what was it that you said? You, did you hear Jason Fung? You heard you saw some book, Gary Taubes. How did you get started? So that's a very interesting story. So um, when I met, when, when we first started, I mentioned I worked at Loma Linda University. A lot of you may know that's a Seventh-day Adventist institution. And it, there's a lot of uh, background uh, on vegetarian and vegan and diet and things. And so that's the environment that I grew up in and I was working in. So I always joke, not only did I have to bust through my insulin resistance, but I had to bust, bust through my personal resistance resistance and the training that I was around in the culture and so but what I said was I did remember something from med school that was important and I remembered what's called now I know it's the oxidative priority of fuels and I, for some reason I remembered that when your body runs out of glycogen carbohydrates it will burn fat because I was so frustrated I was 308 pounds I was like 100 pounds overweight and I was eating all the time I was so hungry I couldn't stop eating and I remember thinking while I was overweight and sick why am I so hungry all the time? Why do I have to keep eating every two or three hours when I've got a hundred pounds of fat? And then I thought, is God or nature so stupid that it designed a body that could be a hundred pounds overweight, but yet it still needed to eat every two hours? And I said, well, let's pretend that that's not true. Let's pretend that there's a better design and, and our body is smart enough to figure out how to use fat. So I said, I think, this sounds silly now, okay, but I didn't know about fasting. I didn't know about intermittent fasting or low carb. Okay, I thought I stumbled onto some holy grail thing that I was gonna share with people. But I said, I think it has something to do with what's going in my mouth. And that's why I'm sick, it sounds crazy. So I said, until I know what I'm doing wrong that is hurting me or preventing my body from accessing fat for fuel, I'm not gonna eat. That's how I started, quote, fasting. I didn't know, and then I didn't eat. It took me four days to go without food to figure out when to start eating. Wow, and that's and that's something that's a miserable way to go. You know, I think, miserable. You know, in the church, people can't fast anymore because they're sugar addicted. So you take that sugar away, and they're withdrawing, and they can't seek God. They're like miserable, right? So I think one of those things when you start having that peace and that comfort and, and doing, I mean, you white knuckled it through. That's pretty major. That shows major willpower because really you were starving because your insulin was super high, right? And you couldn't get your fat stored. So that's when you're starving. That's why people lose it. Uh, really quickly. And so what Tro does and, and what my approach has been more is when you first start list, but you're on a higher fat protein diet and eat as much as you want. And then sooner or later you go, okay, I'm not hungry. You stop eating. Exactly. It's crazy because for all of us, it's, we think that's a nutty concept. Right. And so the, um, everybody asks me, well, um, so I was working during this time. I was uh, working at the Loma Linda University and the medical director of going to meetings and seeing patients doing these things. I was absolutely miserable because number one, I didn't know what was going on. I was starving. I was hungry. I was looking at plates and paper and plastic. I wanted to eat everything. And I thought, man, it would be okay if I have something, but I didn't know. And then every day I'd wake up, my wife would say, are you going to eat today? You're going to die. And I said, no, I'm not eating today. She goes, when are you going to eat? I said, well, I don't know, but it's not today. Because remember, I wanted to make sure I was using my fat for fuel, but I didn't know when that happened. I didn't know what it would feel like. Finally, the first couple days, miserable, hungry. Third day, wasn't as miserable, wasn't as hungry, and it, but or I didn't feel good by any means. But then when I woke up on the fourth day, the day that I decided to eat, the reason why I knew it was time to start eating again was because I was getting ready, going to a meeting, wearing my suit, and I was whistling, and I was kind of skipping around and getting ready for work. And I was thinking in my head while I was doing this, I said, this is crazy because I've got, I was like, I got so much energy. Where's it coming from? I haven't eaten in four days. And then the light bulb went off and I said, I'm eating my fat for fuel. I said, this is perfect. Now my body's accessing fat and now I can resume eating. But then I thought, well, that rule from the oxidative priority, if I reintroduce carbohydrates now after four days and I'm using fat, it's going to just go to the carbohydrates and shut down fat burning. But I didn't know any of the beautiful finesse that you, Brian and Tro, do to help their patients have a much more finesse Gucci, I call it, experience. Because so I just white knuckled it and went in. And so I literally just ate a keto Mediterranean style diet. I just had fish and salad one meal a day after the four day fast. And for a hundred days, I ate the same exact thing and I lost 94 pounds. And I stopped snoring, my weight, my blood pressure, everything. I went from a 52 inch waist to 36 inch waist because I never ever, after that four day water fast, reintroduced carbohydrates until I was happy with the fat that I had. That's terrible guys like you who lose weight so quickly they put pressure on everyone else. No, 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 but I'm, it's, it's what's humanly possible. It blew my mind and so that's how I learned about Jason Fung. That's how I learned, I bought all his books and I figured out, I had to go back to my books and I told my wife, I said, I need to get my school book. I literally dust off my 20 year old Lippincott biochemistry and I said, what the heck just happened to my body?
You know, that's a, it's a great, yours is a great story. It, Christian Assad has the same story. Mm -hmm. He was getting sick and tired and we had him on the podcast. He had no idea. He just said, well, I think I should just eat this way and this way. But he didn't realize he was, go, he was getting low sodium and he was having all these other complications. And then he started realizing, oh, that he, all these, there's, I didn't invent this thing, right? Jason didn't invent, invent fasting, despite what everyone says. It was there around a little bit before him, but he was the first one to bring it back into, into vogue and to say, guys, look, here's what the data shows. And I think guys like you who just, you figured out the physiology before you had education, right? So you had to white knuckle through and we can make it a lot easier for our patients now that we understand these things. And because you start realizing you don't have to be tortured and miserable when you change your lifestyle. That's right. Right. You seem like a fairly reasonable guy. I'm very doctor. reasonable. Very. And, and now I've had, I've I've gone undergone other long extended fasts. I've helped and coached other people um, to also benefit from it. And if you if you know what to expect, you know what's happening in your body when it happens, how long it's going to last. You know about salt and water and all these different things. You don't have to feel like 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 you said, Christian Assad. You don't have to feel miserable or have keto flu or cramping and things like that. Um, but I didn't know. Any, I thought I stumbled onto this miracle thing that nobody knew about. And then it's like, yeah, we, okay. So it's a thing. People are doing it and everybody's getting better, yada, yada. So the big question <laughs> is, what did, what did you do about all your old suits? Yeah, so I had to completely throw out all my old suits. I did keep one for posterity's sake because it's so massive. I told my wife, I want to keep one of these because to, to look like I fit into that suit, but I did have to buy. That is a side effect that is expensive. If you lose a lot of weight, you will have to buy a new wardrobe. Yeah, that you know that actually happened. I had my suits taken in, and then I went back. She was like, "We can't do anymore." <laughs> it was more expensive. Like you know, word to the wise: look, buy new suits. It'll be cheaper. Yeah. Now. It's cheaper than having them all reconstructed and all that crazy stuff, right? right? It's cheaper just to like buy new ones. You know, so. Yeah, well, I, I warn people that are going to you know, lose a lot of weight and do this and be successful is the money you're saving, because I ate once a day, I, I didn't eat that much. The money you're saving on not eating, put it away in a jar that's going to buy you new clothes when you're done. Yeah, and it, as an aside, something I didn't get to say in my talk, when I first started out as a young guy, I didn't have gray hairs and all that stuff yet. This old doc with gray hairs was up there talking at a conference. and. He said, 90% of what you treat is lifestyle mediated. He said, think about it. Even pulled muscles and all these. He said, 90%. And I thought, this guy's crazy. And I went back to my practice and started looking. And I think he underestimated, no, I think it's 95%. <laughs> you know, when you start seeing how much of the stuff we do with alcohol right. and drugs and, you know, right. whatever, you know, how many self-inflicted things we do. And being in the ER, you see the consequences. And, and when people ask our passion, why we're passionate, because we've seen the disasters, we've seen the amputations, the infections, the problems, the, the debilitated people suffering. And we wanted to medicine to alleviate that. That's right. It hurts. Um, it, it does hurt to see people suffer. And you know that there's an answer, there's a solution. But it helps that I was in that role. I was both the doctor and then I was the patient, and I remember having not having hope and not and not knowing that these you know diabetes or metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, because there is technically no prescription drug for metabolic syndrome. That's what I was trained. It's just you treat the individual parts with a blood pressure pill or with this or that. But to know that there is a simple method, and here's what I always leave patients with. So you mentioned when you're when a patient's feeling sick or in the hospital, they're they you know having a heart attack. They're a captive audience and they want to listen. So when I'm in the emergency room, there's a patient that's having chest pain. You know, I'll explain to them, I'll say, there's hope. You can get better. And the, the, the nice thing about this whole thing is, and I learned from the experience from myself, I got better not from starting to add new food into my life. I was already eating fish and, and salad, you see. It was what I stopped doing. When I removed certain things like sugar, I stopped hurting myself. And then when I removed starchy foods and carbohydrate foods, that is what allowed my body to access the program that's already in you and it's free that will do the healing. I didn't do anything. I just sat and I was like watching along for the ride while my body knew to empty liver fat take fat from my butt, from my hips, from my wherever, pancreas, and then tweak all the blood pressure and the parameters and the triglycerides. It's just you have to learn what you're doing that's hurting you, what you're doing that's keeping your body from using the program that's already inside that wants to heal. These are wounds. Just like when your skin gets cut, I'll tell patients in the ER, your body has a program. You got a cut on your skin. We'll clean it. We'll set it up, we'll make it nice. So don't mess with it, don't interfere with the healing process and your body will heal it. Your insides do the same. Yeah, and the good news is if an ER doc can figure this stuff out, pretty much anybody can. <laughs>
<laughs> no, hey, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, it's Thanks awesome. for your story is amazing. I saw you on social media, and, and you know that's one of the great things we can we know each other before we've been met. And I think it's so cool your story and what you do and the hope you're going to give other people. But how do people get in touch with you, do you on social media or is anywhere where people can track you down? Sure, I'm on Twitter. I'm always causing a little ruckus on Twitter. Just I, uh, my goal is to wake up other doctors like myself because I wanted to be woken up a few years ago, and I want to give people hope and inspiration. You can follow me on Twitter. And, and on Facebook as well. What's your, what's your, yeah. ESA Health Solutions on Facebook and Twitter's Dr. Ramon ESA on Twitter. All right. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.